Let's take a journey through the book Hidden Figures, the true story of four Black women and the space race. This book was written by the New York Times best-selling author Margot Lee Shetterly, and was illustrated by Laura Freeman. I'm Dr. Karen Sism Gunn, and I am so happy to be able to share this story with you because it has special meaning to me as well. I too am a black woman. I too am a scientist. And many of these women are members of the same organization that I belong to, the Greek letter organization Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Okay, let's learn the story of the hidden figures. Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden were good at math. I mean, really good. In 1943, the United States was at war, World War II. Dorothy Vaughn wanted to serve her country by working for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the government agency that designed airplanes. Having the best airplanes would help America win this war, making airplanes fly faster and higher and safer meant doing lots of tests at the agency's Langley Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia. Tests meant numbers, numbers meant math, and math meant computers. Today, we think of computers as machines, but in the 1940s, Computers were actual people, like Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine. Their job was to do math. Now, because Dorothy was Black and a woman, some people thought it would be impossible for her to get a job as a computer. She lived in Virginia, a Southern state, where laws segregated or kept apart Black people and white people. They could not eat in the same restaurants. They could not drink from the same water fountains. They could not use the same restrooms. They could not attend the same schools. They could not play on the same sports teams. They could not sit near each other in movie theaters. They could not marry someone of a different race. But Dorothy didn't think this was impossible. She was good at math. I mean, really good. She knew she was the right person for this job. She applied, and the laboratory offered her a position as a computer. At work, blacks and whites were kept apart. The white computers worked in one building, and Dorothy and the other black computers worked in a different building, in their separate office. Even though they worked on the same kinds of assignments, the black computers and the white computers used separate bathrooms and even had to eat in separate lunchrooms. Now, America won the war in 1945, but Dorothy stayed on the job, still trying to make airplanes faster and safer. By 1951, the Americans and the Russians were competing to see who could build the best planes. That meant more experiments and more numbers. Lots and lots of numbers. And more numbers meant the need for more computers. That's when Mary Jackson got a job as a computer at Langley. She worked in a group that tested model airplanes in wind tunnels. A wind tunnel was a machine like a huge metal box with a powerful fan attached. Mary put model airplanes in the wind tunnel and blasted them with air from the fan. This experiment helped her group improve their designs on the models before building full-sized airplanes. Mary wanted to become an engineer, but officials said it was impossible. Most of the engineers at the laboratory were men. And to become an engineer, Mary needed to take high-level math classes. But she wasn't allowed to go inside the white school where the classes were taught. But Mary was good at math. I mean, really good. And she refused to give up. 
She got permission to enter the school building and take the math classes, and she earned good grades. Because she didn't give up, Mary Jackson became the first African-American female engineer at the laboratory. Now, Katherine Johnson was good at math and always asked a lot of questions. In 1953, she applied to the laboratory for a computer job and was placed on a team that tested actual planes while they were flying in the air. Their research was used to figure out ways to prevent future plane crashes. In one of her first projects, she learned how to analyze turbulence or dangerous gusts of air. No one knows how many lives her work may have helped to save. Catherine wanted to help the group prepare its research reports, so she asked if she could go to the meetings with the other experts on her team. Her boss told her it was impossible. Women aren't allowed to attend meetings, he said. But Catherine knew she was as good at math as anyone else, maybe even better. So she asked him again, and again, and again. Catherine asked her boss so many times that he finally invited her to the meetings. Catherine was good at math, really good. And because she fought to be treated the same as the men, she became the first woman in her group to sign her name to one of the group's reports. In the 1950s, the Langley Laboratory bought a machine computer that could do math faster than the human computers. At first, these machines made mistakes. Dorothy learned how to program the machines so that they got the right answers. She taught the women in her group how to program the computers too. In 1957, Russia launched a satellite known as Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. The United States started building satellites to explore space, too. For years, the laboratory had used math to design airplanes. Now it would need math to create spaceships as well. The government decided to change the agency's name from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy told Congress, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Wow, a man on the moon? But the first step to getting a man on the moon was to send an astronaut around the Earth. NASA was going to need to hire more space experts and more people who were good at math. Really good. The people at the laboratory had to work together from morning to night to figure out how to send astronaut John Glenn into space and bring him back home to Earth safely. Katherine Johnson knew she could use math to help. Tell me where you want his spaceship to land, and I'll tell you where to launch it, Catherine told her boss. Catherine helped calculate the, tra the trajectories, or pathways, that rockets traveled through space. She had to plan Glenn's exact route from takeoff in Florida to splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. There was absolutely no room for error. No one was better than Catherine at solving these tricky math problems. Days before his mission, John Glenn wanted Catherine to double check the machine computer's trajectory calculations to make sure it hadn't made any mistakes. When Catherine said the numbers were correct, Glenn was ready to go. On February 20th, 1962, Glenn blasted off into space, circled the earth and made his way home safely. Meanwhile, laws began to change 
so that black and white students could go to school together. Blacks fought for the right to sit beside whites on buses and to drink from the same water fountains. At the laboratory, black and white computers started working together in the same offices, eating at the same lunch tables and using the same bathrooms. Black and white moviegoers could sit next to each other in the same theater. Across the country, people started to think about ways to bring equality to all Americans. Christine Darden was good at math, and she loved electronic computers. She started working at Langley in 1967. Christine wanted to become an engineer, and thanks to Dorothy, Mary, and Catherine, she knew it was possible. Eventually, she became an engineer for supersonic airplanes, planes flying faster than the speed of sound. But her first job was to help with NASA's mission to the moon. The people at the laboratory prepared for years to send astronauts to the moon about 238,900 miles away from the Earth. Wow. Finally, on July 20th, 1969, the world watched as the three men arrived at the moon in their Apollo 11 spacecraft. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, said astronaut Neil Armstrong when he stepped onto the dusty surface of the moon. But it was also a giant leap for Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, Christine, and all of the other computers and engineers who had worked at the laboratory over the years. The moon landing was a success from takeoff to splashdown. But there was no time to rest. Once NASA landed astronauts on the moon, the people at the laboratory began dreaming of sending humans to other planets, such as Mars or Jupiter or even Saturn. They started to imagine hyperfast space planes that could travel around the Earth at seven times the speed of sound. The next adventure wouldn't be so easy and would require lots of tests and lots more numbers. But Dorothy, Mary, Catherine and Christine knew one thing. With hard work, perseverance, and a love of math, anything, absolutely anything, was possible. Nearly 60 years lies between the first time that mankind made the first powered flight to the time Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped onto the surface of the moon. Here's a description of the timeline. In 1903, the Wright brothers make the first powered flight. 1915, the federal government establishes the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA. In 1935, the first female computers are hired at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. In 1943, Dorothy Vaughn starts working at NACA, where she stays until 1971. Also in 1943, the first African-American female computers are hired at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory, Dorothy Vaughn being one of the first. In 1951, Mary Jackson starts working at NACA, where she stays until 1985. 1953, Katherine Johnson starts working at NACA, where she stays until 1986. 1954, the Supreme Court case of Brown versus the Board of Education decision rules that it is unconstitutional to have separate schools for black and white students. In 1957, the Soviet Union launches the Sputnik satellite. In 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, replaces the forerunner called NACA. In 1961, 
Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin orbits the Earth. In 1962, John Glenn, a United States astronaut, orbits the Earth. In 1967, Christine Darden starts working at NASA, where she stays on until 2007. And in 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin become the first humans to land on the moon. The author of this book, Hidden Figures, leaves with us a tribute that she gave to her parents, to my parents, Margaret G. Lee and Robert B. Lee III, and to all of the women at Fanaka and NASA who offered their shoulders to stand on. Each time we make an accomplishment, no, not only is that accomplishment a tribute to you, but it's also a pathway for others to be able to follow in your footsteps. I certainly hope you enjoyed taking this journey through the story of the hidden figures. Bye now.